Bon local, mes amours. Today, the House Judiciary Committee held a three-hour hearing with the heads of global policy at Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube in order to address filtering and censorship. I wasn't able to stream this due to health reasons, but I've taken the time to make a two-part digest, annotated with timestamps and covering the most interesting and on-topic questions provided by the committee, as well as the answers provided, so you are able to see this for yourself. I think this is a very important discussion that needs to be had within Congress and by the world at large, though many of the members of the committee would disagree with me and use their time to essentially filibuster and condemn the president. These rants by representatives Raskin, Nadler, Johnson, Cicilline, Liu, Jeffries, and uh, Jayapal have been removed for the sake of sticking to the topic. That said, this video still rounds out to about two hours, so I'm splitting it into two parts. If there's a specific congressman or congresswoman whose questions you'd like to hear, you can find links to those timestamps in the description box below. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on Facebook, Google, and Twitter, examining the content filtering practices of social media giants. And I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Today, we continue to examine how social media companies filter content on their platforms. At our last hearing, which we held in April, this committee heard from members of Congress, social media personalities, legal experts, and a representative of the news media industry to better understand the concerns surrounding content filtering. Despite our invitations, Facebook, Google, and Twitter declined to send witnesses. Today, we finally have them here. Since our last hearing, we've seen numerous efforts by these companies to improve transparency. Conversely, we've also seen numerous stories in the news of content that's still being unfairly restricted. Just before July 4th, for example, Facebook automatically blocked a post from a Texas newspaper that it claimed contained hate speech. Facebook then asked the paper to review the contents of its page and remove anything that does not comply with Facebook's policy. The text at issue was the Declaration of Independence. Think about that for a moment. If Thomas Jefferson had written the Declaration of Independence on Facebook, that document would have never seen the light of day. No one would be able to see his words because an algorithm automatically flagged it, or at least some portion of it, as hate speech. It was only after public outcry that Facebook noticed this issue and unblocked the post. Facebook may be embarrassed about this example. This committee has the opportunity today to ask, but Facebook also may be inclined to mitigate its responsibility in part because it was likely software, not a human being, that raised an objection to our founding document. Indeed, given the scale of Facebook and other social media platforms, a large portion of their content filtering is performed by algorithms without the need of human assistance. And Facebook is largely free to moderate content on its platform as it sees fit. This is in part because over 20 years ago, Congress exempted online platforms from liability for harms occurring over their services. In 1996, the internet was just taking shape. Congress intended to protect it to spur its growth. It worked because the vibrant internet of today is no doubt a result of Congress's foresight, in part. But the internet of today is almost nothing like the internet of 1996. Today we see that the most successful ideas have blossomed into some of the largest companies on earth. These companies dominate their markets, and perhaps rightfully so, given the quality of their products. However, this begs another question. Are these companies using their market power to push the envelope on filtering decisions to favor the content the companies prefer? Congress must evaluate our laws to ensure that they are achieving their intended purpose. The online environment is becoming more polarized, not less, and there are concerns that discourse is being squelched, not facilitated. Moreover, society as a whole is finding it difficult to define what these social media platforms are and what they do. For example, some would like to think of them as government actors, as public utilities, as advertising agencies, or as media publishers, each with its own set of legal implications and potential shortfalls. 
It's clear, however, that these platforms need to do a better job explaining how they make decisions to filter content and the rationale for why they do so. I look forward to the witnesses' testimony. We welcome our distinguished witnesses, and if you'd all please rise, we'll begin by swearing you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you and each of you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you very much. Let the record show that the, all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Our first witness is Monica Bickert, the head of global policy management at Facebook. Our second witness is Juniper Downs, the global head of public policy and government relations at YouTube. And our third and final witness is Nick Pickles, a senior strategist of public policy at Twitter. At Facebook, our mission is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. More than two billion people come to our platform each month to stay connected with friends and family, to discover what's going on in the world, to build their businesses, and to share what matters most to them. Freedom of expression is one of our core values, and we believe that the Facebook community is richer and stronger when a broad range of viewpoints are represented on our platform. Let me ask the witness to expend, uh, uh, suspend for a moment and uh, let me ask those members of the audience who are displaying things in violation of the decorum of the committee to take them down. Thank you very much, and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. People share billions of pictures, stories, and videos on Facebook every day. Being at the forefront of such a high volume of sharing means that we are also at the forefront of new questions about how to engage in automated and manual content filtering to keep our community safe and vibrant. We know that there have been a number of recent high-profile content removal incidents across the political spectrum. Thank you, Mr. Pickles. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by re recognizing myself. Um, all three of you uh, represent companies that have uh, very strong in many instances, dominant market shares in the sectors that you provide services. So I'll ask this to each of you, and we'll start with you, Ms. Bickert. Um, all other things being equal, which company is likelier to be concerned about consumers leaving in response to discriminatory filtering practices? One with a 75% market share or one with 10%? Well, I know that at Facebook we want to make sure that everybody feels welcome. We are a platform for broad ideas across the political spectrum, and we don't want anybody on our platform to feel discriminated against, and we want to make sure that our policies are applied neutrally and fairly. And you think that uh, the lack of competition uh, in your space uh, does not in any way affect that position? Mr. Chairman, I know that right now, the average user of social media in the United States uses eight, approximately eight, um, internet communication services. So clearly people have a choice in the United States when they go online, and Facebook is one service they can use, but they can also use many others. Uh, uh, but Facebook owns more than one of those, right? Uh, we do. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, and we have uh, WhatsApp. But again, users have a lot of choice here, as do advertisers. Ms. Downs? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We operate in an incredibly competitive environment. The tech industry is very dynamic. There are new players and entrants to the market all of the time. And so we have a natural incentive to continue delivering the most trustworthy, high-quality product to our users because we know competition is always one click away. Mr. Pickles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and it's always uh, grateful to uh, remind sometimes that our companies themselves are quite different. Uh, so right. Twitter, you could we argue, it. is smaller than uh, our peers here today. But from our perspective, the primary focus is that every user has a paramount right to free expression, and providing they act within our rules, uh, we're going to defend that right for them. Um, I think the, the question mark of why we make those decisions is focused solely on the behavior of the user and whether they violated our rules. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bickert, do you think that the host of content producers whose speech has been filtered by Facebook would complain as loudly if they could simply switch to a competitor? Mr. Chairman, I think that people do have a choice to use other services. 
Uh, we are keenly aware that users have choice, that advertisers have choice, and that's why we work hard to make sure that Facebook is a place where both users and advertisers want to be. Thank you. Ordinarily, the sort of liability exemptions the social media platforms enjoy are only granted to regulated utilities like phone <coughs> companies. The rationale is that since phone companies do not have full discretion to determine who to serve, to set the terms and conditions of their services, or to interfere with the content they must carry, they should not be held culpable for harms caused by use of their services. Non-utilities, by contrast, are typically subject to judicial liability if they have not done enough to mitigate harms from use of their services. At some point, for example, hotels have a legal obligation to curb sex trafficking in their rooms, or clubs have a legal obligation to curb sale or use of illegal drugs on their dance floors, and pawn shops have a legal obligation to curb fencing of stolen goods in their stores. Property owners have a legal obligation to curb hazards on their grounds, and traditional newspapers and programming networks have a legal obligation to curb defamation over their outlets. Therefore, I'd like to ask, I'll start with you, Ms. Downs, uh, why should your company be treated differently than these other non-utilities that I've just described? YouTube is a service provider that hosts user-generated content at an unprecedented scale. And Section 230 was crafted to allow service providers like us to remove user-uploaded content that violates content policies without assuming publisher liability for all the user-generated content on our site. Without Section 230, we wouldn't be able to remove harmful content like child pornography without fear of liability. Mr. Pickles. I, th well, I think it's fundamental to competition, is how do we ensure that new entrants can come into the market and compete with our businesses? Uh, and 230 is an essential part of that. Uh, and just to build on that point, uh, in our case, for example, uh, we're able to now detect 95% of terrorist accounts on Twitter ourselves using our own technology and remove them quickly in 75% of cases before they have even tweeted. So we're able to take those strong steps because of the legal framework that's in place, uh, but that also protects people competing with us. Now, do each of you agree that Russian government exploited the social media platforms your company provide your companies provide to attack our democracy? Why don't we go left to right? Ms. Bigger first. Ranking Member Nadler, uh, as we have stated publicly, we did find um, accounts run by the Russian Internet Research Agency, both before they ran, uh, posted content on Facebook, both before and after the 2016 election, and we did remove those accounts and report on them. Thank you. Ms. Downs? Thank you, Ranking Member Nadler. We take election interference very seriously, and as we described last year, we did find limited activity on our services, um, limited because of the strong security controls we had in place leading up to the election, but we found two accounts linked to the Internet Research Agency that had a total spend of less than $5,000 on our advertising products and 18 YouTube channels containing 1,000 videos. We terminated all of those accounts pursuant to our investigation. Thank you, Mr. Pickles. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, yes, we removed accounts we believe were linked to the Internet Research Agency, uh, and also based on the findings of the US intelligence community, took the decision to offboard Russia Today and all its associated entities from our advertising products worldwide. Thank you. To the extent you haven't answered this question just now, what steps have your companies taken to prevent further attacks on our democracy? If you've already answered it, you've just said that. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. We are working actively with academics, with others in industry, with government officials to make sure we're doing all we can to protect the elections uh, coming up here and around the world. We're also improving our technology to help us find bad actors earlier. We're committed to working with Congress to ensure the integrity of our elections. We've undertaken a wide range of approaches, including a suite of tools called Protect Your Election that we've been using in our outreach to campaigns. We've worked with both the RNC and the DNC to educate them about these tools to protect election websites from hacking and interference. We also have adopted new transparency measures around election advertising, requiring verification of those purchasing ads and ad labeling, and we will publish election ads publicly. 
Thank you. So we've also uh, improved advertising transparency, um, ads.twitter.com forward slash transparency. Um, one point I would like to flag is that um, the improvement in technology that we have made in a year on year from this time last year, uh, we now challenge 9.9 .9 million accounts every week for suspicious activity, and that's a 299% increase on this time last year. Thank you, Ms. Bickard. According to Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Christopher Wiley, Facebook data from 87 million Facebook profiles was used to develop psychographic profiles of users, which were then used by the Trump campaign to target users with online pro-Trump adver advertisements. Cambridge Analytica reportedly acquired this data from researcher Alexander Kogan, who collected the data through a person personality quiz app he created for Facebook's platform. According to news accounts, Facebook learned that Mr. Kogan had passed his data to Cambridge Analytica in 2015, demanded that his data be deleted, and asked the parties to certify that it was deleted. At that time, did Facebook take any additional steps beyond the self-certification to confirm this data has been deleted? And currently, when Facebook determines that data has been acquired or used by a third-party app in, app in violation of company policies, does your company take active steps to confirm that any improperly acquired or used data is secured or destroyed? The time of the gentleman has expired. The, the witness may answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman, after we were notified uh, of the potential breach in December of 2015, uh, we did take steps to obtain a certification from Cambridge Analytica, um, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll echo uh, the comments of our CEO when he testified before Congress on this, but we are taking many steps now to make sure that we understand the extent of uh, any data that may have been passed to Cambridge Analytica, and that we are also taking steps to make sure that this has not happened with other apps, or that if we do uncover any abuse, that we disclose it to anybody who may have been affected. Thank you very much. Ms. Downs, uh, I'm sorry you're from YouTube. I uh, understand the request was for Google, and you're a, a subsidiary, and you, you may find this not as on point to YouTube, but there are similar examples at YouTube, so, uh, but I'm gonna phrase this in a Google corporate fashion, if you don't mind. Uh, last month, <clears throat> Google uh, provided a link for the California GOP, the, uh, the official website of the Republican Party in California, uh, that unfortunately, because of a decision made by Wikipedia not to discipline and control their own content, uh, had a reference to Nazism for the California Republican Party. Now, I'm a big supporter of emerging technologies, and I will always defend that things can happen in emerging technology that are unintended, and over time they get corrected. And each of your three companies and the many companies that your companies have acquired deal with that every day. But when Google was a younger company, it was a blue box reference company, meaning that by definition what you did was if I clicked on, if I Google searched something, uh, what I would end up with is I'd end up with a list of places that I could then click on and go to. In the case of Wikipedia, currently Google is using Wikipedia, sc scraping the information and essentially using it almost as though it's own content, meaning you're providing not a link to this site, but you're in fact putting their information out as your information. Since Wikipedia is a external fairly broad in many cases, list of people, sometimes with political biases that will deliberately distort or uh, do bad things to a site, and YouTube faces the same situation. How are we to hold you accountable when in fact, instead of simply being a search source, you in fact are scraping the information, and this could be, obviously we could look at, at how you treat restaurants, in some cases making them your own, uh, and, and so on, but specifically, when you absorb the content, aren't you absorbing the responsibility? And since, in the case of Wikipedia, clearly you were not scrubbing the content. Thank you. So knowledge panels are derived from a variety of sources across the web, including Wikipedia and other sources like the CIA World That's not Fact the question, ma'am. The, the question is, aren't you absorbing the responsibility and can't and shouldn't we hold you responsible at least to the level of care that newspapers ever so poorly are held to? 
So we have robust protections in place to protect from this type of vandalism. And when we include information from other sites, like Wikipedia or other, other, any other site, we also include a link to their, to their um, site so that users can click through to the, the original website and read the information there. So we still are following the traditional model of search to link to information across the web. It's just an opportunity for users to get information at a glance alongside organic search results. In the case of the California Republican Party, you're correct that Wikipedia was vandalized. We have protections in place to protect our services from showing information that's shared across the web pursuant to that kind of vandalism. Unfortunately, our systems didn't catch it in time in this instance, but we did um, fix it as soon as we were on notice and apologize to the California Republican Party for the So year. now for each of you, uh, a question that piggybacks the chairman's question. Uh, as your technologies now across the board are by definition mature, uh, not just because they're more than a decade old in most cases, but because in the, uh, if you will, the quarterly speed that goes on in, in San Jose and, and in other emerging technology areas, uh, if we don't hold you accountable after a decade, then the reality is we never get past a decade. New technologies typically come in. So each of your technologies, why is it today that this this side of the dais shouldn't begin looking at holding you accountable for what you publish that you, no matter where you scrape it from, if you make it your own, if you adopt it, why shouldn't we hold you at least to the level of care that we hold public newspapers and other media to? And I'll go right down the aisle. Vickers. Thank you, Congressman. We feel a tremendous sense of accountability for how we operate our service, and it is in our business interest to make sure that our service is a safe place. Mine is a strict liability question. Should we open you up to litigation under the standards of care that the, if you will, other media are held to? And, and if you could answer briefly, because my time has expired, each of you. Congressman, uh, we believe that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is essential for online uh, companies like those represented here today. And we also believe it's consistent with operating safe products that give consumers choice. Anyone else, please? We believe that the openness that's enabled by 230 has brought tremendous benefits to the world. And for most of our products and services, we don't do the things many traditional publishing operations do, like author or copy edit content. I think such an approach risks putting speech at risk and it risks competition. Um, our role is to have clear rules, to enforce those rules well, and to be more transparent in how we're doing that to build trust and confidence. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate all their comments, but I would note that free speech was created and supported by a newspaper system from our founding that lived by different rules, and I yield back. Well, I, I, I think this is such an interesting hearing, I, I think motivated by <clears throat> a sense of a persecution on the part of Republicans and conservatives that somehow they're being unfairly treated when they have a majority in the House, the Senate, the, the White House. And when the analysis shows uh, by uh, Newswit that uh, conservative news sites have three times more user engagement than liberals do, there's been no uh, evidence whatsoever that I have seen and that the majority has been able to provide that there's any bias whatsoever. Um, I, you know, the idea that we would adopt SOPA somehow in response to this feeling of persecution is astonishing to me. But I'd like to get into another issue, which is really the business model that is used in the digital environment that I think has uh, an unintended uh, consequence. Whether it's content discovery or user engagement or targeted advertising, your algorithms target what a user wants to see. And so, uh, in other words, what I see is really tailored to my interests. And that's really for an advertising purpose. But the net result is that Americans have been isolated into bubbles. Now, where the purpose was really to sell ads, the net effect is that all of us have sort of ended up in echo chambers uh, with confirmation bias that has allowed the American 
uh, public to be exploited by our enemies. Uh, and, you know, the Russians uh, have tried to attack our infrastructure. We know that now from the indictments. The Russian military was involved. This isn't meddling. This is an attack on the United States. And uh, our people have been made more vulnerable because of the isolation that is the side product of your advertising uh, model. So I'm wondering if you have, each of you, given some thought on how the model might be adjusted so that individuals who end up in these bubbled echo chambers can be freed from those echo chambers and have a more generic experience so that Americans can begin talking to each other again instead of just being uh, led down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories uh, related to one political theory or another. If each of you could share your thoughts on that. Thank you, Congresswoman. We let users know when information that we're providing to them has been personalized. We believe transparency there is very important. So for example, on YouTube with Watch Next, with their recommended videos, we label recommended for you if something is based on things that the user has watched before and it's a personalized recommendation. In but, our search- But most people don't look at that. They're just getting the next, uh, and it's in, they're getting the next view because it's something that it's a preference, and it's so you can sell ads, but it isolates further and further down that rabbit hole. What else are you doing? So in our search and recommendations generally, we aim to show users information from a variety of sources. In fact, we have research that shows that users um, do like to engage with content from a variety of sources. So um, we are very conscious of not wanting to, to isolate people. And because we have such a breadth and depth of content on our services, um, we, we aim to de design products in a way that shows content from diverse sources. What about Facebook? Thank you, Congressman. We've got a number of initiatives uh, that are designed to increase the breadth of information that people come across if they're interacting with news on Facebook. Um, first, we announced back in, uh, I believe it was December, that we were working with third-party fact-checkers. If we have indications that something on Facebook, a news story, may be false, then we are sharing beneath the news article related articles from well, around the... Let me ask a follow-up question, because millions of Americans were sent material by the Russian military. Would Facebook contact each Facebook user and say, you were uh, sent this by the Russian military in an effort to influence you? Anybody who saw content that was put on Facebook by Russia's IRA, we did proactively send notice to. Um, and let them know. And all of those accounts violated our policies. The mistake we made was we didn't catch them fast enough, and we've improved our systems to make sure that we do. Uh, what we're doing going forward to combat the issue that, that uh, you mentioned with people getting into bubbles, uh, first I would note that our, our research does suggest actually, and we're looking at studies from, from um, other places as well, that suggest that people actually come into a broader range of views when they are online versus when they are offline. Uh, on Facebook, there are uh, people, in general, have about 23% of friends come from different political ideologies than themselves. So we know that diversity is already out there. What we're trying to make sure we're doing is giving people the information to make educated choices about the news they want to interact with. And we're doing that through this related articles um, and other programs that we put out since uh, December and January. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank all the witnesses. I, I know that um, you can't necessarily see the entire gallery behind you, but I would point out that there's not one gray head in the entire PAC gallery today. There must be a message in that uh, for all of us in, on this panel and in this room and for America. A lot of youth have stepped up and are paying attention to where this goes. And I would say remember these days and look back about 20 years ago when Section 230 was passed uh, with an anticipation of what the internet would grow into and with great care to making sure it had the kind of flexibility to grow into the companies we have before us today. We shouldn't be surprised if we have a few problems and maybe some serious ones that have emerged. Um, but on the other hand, we do have a lot of freedom. And uh, so I'd turn, um, I'd turn first to uh, Ms. Bickert and I'd point out that um, 
It's a matter of uh, congressional record uh, that Gateway Pundit, uh, Mr. Jim Hoft, has uh, introduced information into the record that in the span of time between 2016 and 2018, he saw his Facebook traffic cut by 54 percent. Um, and could you render an explanation to that uh, for him and for me, Ms. Bickert? Thank you, Congressman. I can't speak to any one individual's decline uh, in reach or popularity on Facebook. I can say that we do change the way that our newsfeed algorithm works. Uh, the algorithm basically, it's individualized and it gives people, it sorts or ranks content for each individual user based on people that they follow, pages that they follow, um, groups that they belong to. So it's an inventory of content that, that uh, they have chosen. And we do make changes to that over time, and we have made some this year that might affect whether or not people have, um, it might affect their reach in some way, but there are also other factors, such as how appealing their content is or what sorts of uh, content they're producing and, and try, who they're trying to reach okay. that would also affect it. But it, I mean, we actually did speak to Diamond and Silk, but uh, their, their issue, and they watched their traffic drop too, and I saw, I saw them repeat a, a tweet after you lifted the, the, apparently the algorithm that had uh, cut down on their uh, distribution of their content. But um, what you've described to me, I think there are a series of judgment calls that are being made. Can you be more precise on how an algorithm actually works? So let me just try this definition, um, a series of if-then formulas that are written uh, so that, uh, let's just say if a certain word shows up, then that sets up a, a, um, a software alarm bell that if perhaps connected with another word or two or a phrase would cause it automatically to be kicked out. Is that a fair explanation of what goes on? Uh, it works a little differently than that, Congressman. What the algorithm looks to is what is the type of content, it looks at, at things like uh, what is the type of content that an individual user tends to interact with, what's the recency of a certain piece of content, what type of engagement is that content generating. There is no, uh, there is no point at which an individual Facebook employee decides where an individual piece of content will go in somebody's newsfeed. This is based on giving users the content that is the most relevant to them based on their interactions with the site. Okay, and but there's still judgment calls involved and you have people uh, that are ethics experts that are, um, that are applying a certain strategy to the algorithms. Is that a fair assessment? We definitely do have, uh, the algorithms are written by people and uh, we do definitely with, with look at With the counsel of your ethicists? We definitely make sure that we are taking into account um, ethics and fairness as okay. we work on our algorithms. Have you as used we do the with Southern Poverty Law Center as one of those advisory groups? Uh, no, Congressman. We do talk to more than 100 organizations in the course of setting our content policies, and um, that includes organizations from around the world. They do not have uh, any, n no organization has. Uh, decision making over our content policies. But not That's SPLC something. has not been under contract or been a formal advisor uh, to no. Facebook in any way. Uh, no, Congressman, not that, I, not that I'm aware. Okay. We have talked to SPLC as, along with more than 100 other organizations in the course of getting input from our community about what we can okay. do better. So, all right, I could go further with that, but instead I think I'll just, in the seconds I have left, uh, I would ask you to contemplate an alternative Ms. Downs now. Um, and by the way, I tweeted out the picture of the gallery, so you know that, Mr. Pickles. Um, but um, Ms. Downs, uh, I think you have a sense and a concern about where this is going. And uh, I'm all for freedom of speech and free enterprise and for competition and finding a way that we can have competition that self that does its own regulation so government doesn't have to. But if this gets uh, further out of hand, it appears to me that Section 230 needs to be reviewed. And one of the discussions that I'm hearing is, what about uh, converting the large behemoth um, organizations that we're talking about here into public utilities? How do you respond to that particular query, Ms. Downs? The time of the gentleman has expired. The witness may answer the question. Thank you, Chairman. As I said previously, we operate in a highly competitive environment. Um, there are, the, the tech industry is incredibly dynamic. We see new entrants all of the time. Um, we see competitors across, um, across all of our products at Google. Um, and, and we believe that the framework that governs our services is an appropriate way to continue to support innovation. 
Ms. Bickert, Facebook's 2016 woes with fake news have been well documented. Foreign actors used your platform to generate and cultivate untrue stories, and Russian-backed Facebook posts reached millions of Americans. Your company has been working to fight fake news since then, but misinformation still exists. Does Facebook believe that it has a responsibility to fact check your platform? And looking ahead uh, to November, are you planning on doing anything different for the midterm elections compared with what you're doing now? Yes, Congressman, we're doing a lot, a lot um, more, and I think we've gotten a lot better since the 2016 election. And I'll point to three things quickly. One is we've gotten much better at removing fake accounts. The accounts that, the, that Russia's IRA had on Facebook around the 2016 election were inauthentic. We now have a mix of technical tools and human reviewers that have gotten much faster at identifying and removing those types of accounts. And before the French election, the German election, we removed tens of thousands of such accounts that uh, we know to have been inauthentic. The second thing we're doing is requiring much greater transparency around advertising. Now, if somebody runs a political or issue ad in the United States, you can see who paid for that advertisement. You can also see all the ads that that entity is running, even if they are not targeting you at all. Um, we're requiring identity verification for anybody who's running those ads. And um, finally, we are working to reduce the spread of false news through Facebook. We know this is a problem, and we're doing things like working with third-party fact checkers to identify when content might be false, and then providing relevant information to users so that they can make an informed decision about what to trust. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Ms. Downs, could she respond to that briefly? Yes, and I, I will, uh, without objection, Thank extend you. another minute, because I'd like to follow up with one of the questions Ms. Bick Bickert answered. I'll yield, yours. I'll yield to the gentleman. I just want to, the second point you made about disclosing uh, who paid for a political ad, do you also disclose how much they paid or the rate they paid for the ad? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, we just disclosed, I believe we just disclosed who paid for it. I can follow up with details on how we do that. Thank you. Ms. Downs, you can answer the Thank question. You. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate you being here today. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues across the aisle for their concerns about Russian interference with our elections because it's been going on for 70 years. It helped Truman get elected in 48. Eisenhower called the Russians on it in 56, the manipulation there. Khrushchev bragged in 60 that he helped throw the election to Kennedy. It's been going on. Uh, the Progressive Party, as they were called uh, previously, and now it's been reemerged. Um, and the Democratic help to Jimmy Carter, um, it, it's, uh, or, or the help from Russians. So I am thrilled that we're gonna get help across the aisle to get uh, the Russian input stopped. But I need to ask each of you, you've been asked specifically about Russian uh, use of your platforms, but uh, did you ever find any indication of use of your platform utilized by the Chinese, North Korea, or any other foreign country, intelligence, or agency of that country? First, Ms. Bigger. Uh, I would note, Mr. Uh, I would note, uh, Congressman, that we are not in North Korea or China. In terms of whether we've seen attacks on our services, we do have, we are of course a big target, we do have a robust security team that uh, works Well, but that's not my question. It's just a very direct question. Have you found use? You don't have to be in North Korea to be North Korean intelligence and use. We have foreign governments, intelligence agencies in this country. So have, it seemed to me you were each a little bit vague about, oh yes, we found hundreds or whatever. I'm asking specifically, were any of those other countries besides Russia that were using your platform inappropriately? It should be a yes or no. I don't have the details. I know we definitely work to detect and repel attacks. I know that, but sale. were any of them other foreign entities other than Russia? I, I can certainly follow up with you on that. So you don't know? You sure know seemed anxious to answer the Democrats' questions about Russia influence and you don't really know of all the people, of all of the groups that inappropriately used your platform, you don't know which were Russians and which were other foreign entities? 
Congressman, we certainly have seen um, attacks from people other than Russians as far as the details of from whom those attacks have come. I would have to have my team follow up with you on those. So you don't know about China? You're sure about Russia, but you don't even know about China? I would have to have my team follow up with you on details. So you came prepared to help the Democrats establish about Russia, but you can't point out any other country? Is that right? Congressman, uh, we've put public statements okay, on Okay, well, let me go to... You're not answering the question. Uh, let me go to Ms. Downs. How about on Google? Uh, did you detect any other countries besides Russia utilizing your platform inappropriately? Our security team is trained to protect our services from foreign interference. Are we going to get to an answer to my question? Um, so the, the team is, has certainly... Um, Are we going to get to an answer to my question? Did you find any other countries besides Russia that were using your platform inappropriately? Very simple. The investigation we conducted was specific to Russian interference in the 2016 election, but... You don't know if China did or not? I... I my, my guess would be that our security team has so you're here to guess. attempts at breaching our security from other foreign governments as well, but that information is held confidentially even internally. So, so you're I'm only here to, to, to uh, condemn the Russians. Thank you. How about you, Mr. Pickles? Are you prepared to identify any other foreign countries or just here to help the Democrats blast uh, Russia after 70 years of Russia helping Democrats? Well, I'm certainly happy to help the committee and yourself understand our work to defend elections. I understand that, but did you find any other countries besides Russia that inappropriately used Twitter? So we suspend these accounts because they are breaking our rules. I understand that. Did you find any other countries or their agencies inappropriately using Twitter? Well, to echo points of my colleagues, I think our services... People so did you find any services. other countries besides Russia that inappropriately used your Twitter? So I'm happy to follow up on that specific question. But, but you did not come prepared to answer any question about any other country but Russia. Is that correct? So I think what's important on the election... You answered the question about Russia. You can't answer about China, yes or no. So we make these decisions based on our rules. <laughs> You're very good at dodging the, and uh, refusing to answer the question. And let me just say, I think had the uh, key to the solution here when he said that he didn't think they discriminated, but if they did, they have every bit, every bit as much right as Fox News and Sinclair... There's the key. They should be just as liable as Fox News and Sinclair. You bet. The time of the gentleman has expired, and the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, is recognized for five minutes. Please forgive me. I am probably going to be coughing, <clears throat> and I apologize. Uh, but let me uh, thank Ms. Bickert, uh, Ms. Downs, and Mr. Pickles, first of all, <clears throat> for representing uh, the kind of uh, technological engines that have been um, a real asset, uh, an anchor of America's genius. It is a responsibility of Congress to uh, give guidance and regulation, as we have noted, the expanse of both, or including, it's not both, it's three of you, <clears throat> Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Uh, and I think you recognize that uh, in your businesses that it's important for congressional oversight. Ms. Bickard, I, I'm just getting a yes or no. Is that your appreciation? Yes, definitely. Uh, Ms. Downs? Yes, we're always happy to work with Congress. Mr. Pickles? Yes, absolutely. And you have done so. And so I'm going to have a line of questioning. I know my um, colleague earlier, Mr. Raskin, uh, mentioned a lot of issues that this committee should be addressing. And my time is going, but I will reiterate, we have not had hearings dealing with the snatching of children from families. Uh, and um, we are not and have not had uh, elections dealing with the intrusion and the invasion of the election in particular by certain countries. So let me just ask you this. On uh, July um, the 13th, <clears throat> the Mueller investigation issued an indictment of 12 Russian intelligence officers, some of them military. Again, I'll be asking yes or no questions. Ms. Pickard, uh, did your company have any involvement in that indictment? Uh, Congresswoman, we have cooperated with the investigations 
um, since we have been asked, and we've been public about that cooperation. Uh, you have cooperated. Did you have any direct involvement with the ultimate result of an indictment? I, I can't speak to uh, the indictments or how they were put together, but we have uh, cooperated with investigations. Ms. Downs? <clears throat> Not to my knowledge. Uh, Mr. Pickles. Uh, we have cooperated, but specifically on the indictment, not to my knowledge. So we have three people here that um, have provided the necessary information, but if we are to extrapolate what a prosecutor does, then we know that they do that independent of the information that they receive. So I want to pose uh, a comment and then uh, proceed with a series of questions. Uh, first of all, as I indicated, this committee needs to proceed with hearings involving uh, the uh, question of the Russian intrusion and stealing of the 2016 election. And I've come to a conclusion now that it was truly stolen. Um, and dealing with uh, these engines that have been effective for the United States on that issue seems to be a stretch and inappropriate. But I do think it's important that we have the ability to provide, to allow freedom to the extent that people are utilizing the First Amendment. Do you believe that the First Amendment covers your, uh, each of your companies? Ms. Bickett, I'm just going down the line. Uh, well, Congresswoman, we do have community standards about what is acceptable and not acceptable, uh, but certainly to the extent that the First Amendment regulates uh, the government, we operate consistent with U.S. laws. Ms. Downs. As a private company, we aren't bound by the First Amendment, but obviously we um, work with the U.S. government on, um, on meeting any of our obligations in terms of how speech is regulated in the U.S. Um, I'd echo those points just to emphasize, again, we have our own rules that we're proactive in enforcing uh, with, to make sure that speech on Twitter is within those rules. Well, I think what you're saying, I think private companies are bound by the First Amendment. I think what you're saying is that we can't cry fire in a crowded theater, and so you are able to regulate accordingly. So let me ask the question, Ms. Bickert, what are you doing to prevent Unite the Right, the organizer of the Charlottesville rally, from using the FB to plan their upcoming rally in mid-August if it is uh, declared and is conspicuously hate speech? Congresswoman, any time that we see somebody organizing an event for violent purposes or engaging in calls for violence or hate speech, we will remove it from the site. Ms. Downs, what are you doing uh, as relates to your company's data privacy policies and methods in which you comply with these policies? We've invested considerable resources at Google to create one of the most sophisticated privacy programs in existence. Thousands of employees are dedicated across the company to work daily to ensure we protect the privacy and security of our users. Our three guiding principles are transparency, control and choice. We believe in being transparent with users, communicating in clearer language, and there's a single um, destination called My Account that we've created where users can see all of the data that we collect and store um, and have control over um, revoking any permissions they've given previously, et cetera. It's a very well-used site, over 1.6 billion visitors in 2016. Mr. Pickles, can you share any of the changes? You've made about 30 of your product changes, can you share some of them with us? Absolutely, so one example might be we rolled out a new policy focusing on violent extremist groups. Those are groups who focus on encouraging uh, violence against civilians, um, which we clarified our policy. Uh, we also rolled out um, a change last week, you may have seen, where we updated people's following numbers to make sure they're authentic uh, and don't include locked accounts. Um, and we've also rolled out for the US midterms specific new labeling for accounts that belong to candidates in those elections. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all over here. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Pickles, because Ms. Bickett gets hit with uh, usually the first, uh, tell us what you think. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, read a legal term, libel. I think you're all familiar with that. Libel is to publish in print, including pictures, writing, or broadcasts, through radio, television, or film, and on truth about another which will do harm to that person or his or her reputation by tending to bring that target into ridicule, hatred, scorn, or contempt of others. So we all understand what that is, uh, given the fact that uh, your companies reach 
I think far more people than a conglomeration of uh, the newspapers, radios, and televisions combined in the United States. Have any of you sat back and considered libel, or do you think you are immune from it? Sir. Happy to start, and thank you for the opportunity to outline what we do in this area. So as we said, we have clear rules that govern what happens on Twitter. Um, some of those behaviors are deplorable, and we want to remove them immediately. So terrorist content is one example, where we now detect 95% of the terrorist accounts that we removed. Okay, I, I, I understand that, sir, but how about we in Congress, we uh, put up with it all the time. I, kn I know that we're cons we are uh, uh, public officials, same way as people in, in the movies or so on, but do you specifically look for an address? Republication can be used uh, in a defama and defamation case. Do you look at libel and defamation content? So we, as I say, we focus on our rules. Those rules govern a wide range of okay, behavior. So with all due respect, I've heard you focus on your rules about 32 times today. Do you look for libel or defamation in your company's opinion? So I, I think, well, our company's opinion is, is expressed in those rules. They're publicly available. Okay. If you're abusive, that, that, if you're harassing, we now you lose. Now you've answered my question, so thank you. Next. Thank you, Congressman. So YouTube is a platform for user-generated content, and we respect the law in the nearly 200 countries where we operate, which means once we're on notice of content that may violate the law, we take action by blocking it for the relevant jurisdiction. Is it specific to, towards defamation and or libel? Including defamation removals, yes. Okay, but you know the, uh, the reproduction of those statements uh, have, have you ever been sued, did you know of, based on defamation and libel? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Ms. Bickett. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, similar to YouTube, we do have a notice and takedown um, approach where people can submit legal notifications to us of illegal speech, and that would include, uh, where appropriate, notifications of libel. Where do you draw the line, each of you? We still have some time. I'll start with you, Ms. Speaker. Where do you draw that line? Do you have specific rules, uh, policy, that determine in your company's opinion what is libel and what is defamation? So there's, there's two ways that this might be addressed. One would be if it was a violation of, say, our bullying or harassment policies. Because we know, we know young people are committing suicide because of things that are said about them on the internet, but please go ahead. And, and we take that, that threat extremely seriously, Good. which is why we don't allow bullying and we do consider it a safety-related um, policy. Oh, so that's, that. those are our own lines. And then separately, we sometimes will receive notifications that are legal takedown requests for speech that breaches the law in a specific jurisdiction. Our legal team evaluates those and if appropriate, then we'll remove that speech. Okay, Stans. We have a very similar process in place for legal removals. Once we're on notice of content that has been deemed to violate the law, then our team evaluates it and blocks for the relevant jurisdiction. On top of that, we also have content policies for our platforms like YouTube that prevent and prohibit things like harassment and, and so on. So um, that we take those policies particularly seriously when it comes to young people, um, and we have various protections in place um, to ensure that we're enforcing them robustly. Okay. Mr. Pickles. Uh, one additional, uh, hopefully useful piece of information is we also work with a site called Lumen, uh, which is a project which discloses when we do take content down, subject to legal orders as described, and we also publish the number of times we do that in a transparency report. Do you do that through AI, artificial intelligence, and or uh, individuals reviewing? Could you all three quickly answer that because my time has just run out and I yield back? Uh, that's people. We use a mix of humans and technology to enforce our policy, and legal removal requests are, are um, reviewed by a special legal team. 